Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Rashi Christie evening. And uh, uh, well, let me start with introdu introducing Rashi Christie. Uh, Rashi Christie is a apologetics campus ministry where we seek to equip uh, Christian students to be able to defend their faith and uh, also to, 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 to be able to give historical, scientific, philosophical, and many other reasons for following Jesus Christ, and also uh, and also be able to engage with the uh, with the big ideas in the culture around them in a very meaningful and effective manner. And uh, ever since the lockdown last year, we started uh, our online ministry as well. And so this is this is part of that. And so uh, being a campus ministry and a student ministry, Rosio Christi is dependent upon uh, donations so if there's anyone out there and uh, uh, who's able to and in a position to maybe support us in a financial manner we always appreciate that very much and uh, so if if you if you um, if you're in such a position in any way we, we always appreciate that and we, I can also encourage um, you guys to go and check out our website um, rashukristi.co.za um, we publish weekly um, articles on our website. It's very informative and uh, that will also uh, equip you um, and teach you a lot about different ideas, different topics about Christianity and, um, and other, other features of, um, <clears throat> of a Christian worldview. And um, of course, uh, you, you'll find the links to, um, to our website and the donation page in the description of this video below. So, uh, so that's just who we are. That's what we're, we're doing. And uh, currently in South Africa, we have uh, five chapters. We have a Rashi Christi chapter at the University of Pretoria. That's where I am stationed. And um, we have one in Potchefstroom at the Northwest University. We have one at Rhodes University, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and um, also at Stellenbosch University. So, um, so that's where we are stationed across the country. And, um, and then tonight we're gonna do the uh, we're gonna address the topic of just um, engaging with the with the objections of popular atheism against Christianity. And our guest speaker this evening is Professor Richard Howe. He is a dear friend of Rashi Christie South Africa. He has visited us in the past. Uh, he's he's talked on all the university campuses uh, campuses I've just mentioned, where we have um, given him. Uh, events and arranged events for him to engage and in fact he's also uh, participated in a debate at the um, Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth where he uh, he um, he was uh, participating in a panel discussion and, and a debate with Professor Ing Stoker they were the two Christians and they um, debated two um, atheistic scholars who's there uh, there at the University of uh, Nelson Mandela and um, <clears throat> so Richard, Professor Richard Howe has really helped us a lot with our ministry efforts here in South Africa. We appreciate him very much. And um, he is currently a professor at the Southern Evangelical Seminary. And uh, that's where he teaches. And um, yes, yeah, so, so Richard, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And um, I'm looking forward to listening to you. And um, engaging, and you listening to you engaging on this um, topic as well of just uh, addressing the objections of popular atheism. Well, listen, the, it's all my pleasure. Uh, it's such an honor for me uh, uh, at several levels. First of all, I just love Ratio Christie. Uh, I've had just opportunities to do a lot of them uh, there in South Africa, as you mentioned, and also here in the United States. and. So I just love what God's doing on the campuses around the world. And I just praise God for soldiers like you and, and the others down there that are fighting the good fight. So thank you for that. So I just, I love getting in on it, basically. So let me let me start my timer so that I'll know when uh, three hours is up. Uh, <laughs> well, we have to convert it. So I know it's 40 minutes or so for, for South Africa uh, time. So now also I'm, I'm gonna share a screen if that's all right with everybody. Uh, this very first picture that you see here, let me, let me get it up uh, and tell me if you guys can see that. Give me a good nod there, okay. Now, if you know who and why this is funny, or supposed to be funny at least, first person to get it in the 
Combox or chat or whatever you call it on YouTube, uh, then we'll see who it is and you'll win absolutely nothing uh, if, if the first person that does that. Uh, but at any rate, I'm not going to tell you unless somebody reminds me towards the end, if nobody gets to go, OK, what was the deal with the picture at the at the beginning or whatever? So uh, uh, it's titled Answering the Arguments of Popular Atheism. I'm just going to show you a few slides out of a series that I do uh, in a class that I teach here at the seminary titled uh, Contemporary Atheism, of which popular would be a subset. And I'll explain what that is. So. I want you to be able to get not only the slides that you'll see tonight, but the other slides that I leave out and strewn across uh, four presentations. So to do that, you would just go to my cheesy website. It's pretty static, but I think the links work. It's richardghow.com. Don't leave out the G and uh, Dr. Moritz can tell you what that stands for. So you'll never forget. But if you put richardhow.com, you're going to get some lawyer in the U.S. and Maybe you could use him. I don't know. Maybe you could sue me for, for all I know, but whatever. But richardghow.com. When you do, you look at the top and you'll see this tab resources. Uh, it won't be blinking when you get it. But when you click on that, it'll give you four choices. If during the next few minutes I, I say something like, I've got a paper on my website, then you would just go to resources and then click on papers. Papers. I've written papers. Other people have written their PDFs you can download, links to things on the internet having to do with Bible apologetics and uh, philosophy. Same thing with multimedia. If I say, I've got a video on my website, it'll be either a link or something you can just right click and download or just click and watch on, on yours. But the one that's relevant for us tonight are the PowerPoint uh, PDF slide decks. What I've, done, what I've done over the years is taken my presentations that I do at Ratio Christie's and other events, and also my classes at the seminary, Southern Evangelical Seminary. Uh, I know you can't see me because I'm probably a little small thumbnail, but there we go. We get the product placement in there so you can see Southern Evangelical Seminary. When you click on that, uh, it'll take you to basically an alphabetized list of all of my PowerPoints. So you're welcome to look through any of those. The ones particularly relevant for tonight are answering the arguments of popular atheism. As you can see there, it's got four parts to it. So what I've done is just taken a sample out of each of the four parts, put it together in just one short presentation. Just a few introductory comments on the subject of atheism before we get more specifically into popular atheism, whatever that means. Back in the 60s, the milieu in Western civilization, uh, not just the United States, but also Europe and other uh, uh, nations around the world, the milieu was becoming more progressively atheistic. And Time Magazine, which is kind of a barometer of a lot of cultural trends, noticed this, that atheism was becoming maybe more and more prominent in a way that it had never been in Western civilization, certainly never been since the onset of uh, Christianity. And, the, and so this article is all about that. It's kind of, the cover is in a lot of books is sort of symbolic of, you know, is, is the time for considering the relevance of God now gone? God's passé as a relevant concept in modern scientific age. Interestingly, though, not too many years later, uh, Time Magazine followed suit was, is God coming back to life? Uh, oddly, the, the, right after they sort of did the eulogy and the funeral for God, all of a sudden they started noticing that there was a resurgence of uh, religion at, at a lot of spectrum from the general marketplace uh, in, in the arts and music, but also in academics. So they're interesting articles to read. And of course, atheism is everywhere, just like uh, any number of religions are everywhere and other worldviews. You can find them, especially with the Internet, where, where people can now freely, at least hopefully freely, uh, be able to say what they think about life and death and meaning and, and uh, origins and these kind of things. So I, I just did a kind of a quick survey just to say what's atheism look like in in uh, in Africa, generally in South Africa. In, in particular, of course, there's no end to these kinds of websites, not just only for atheism, but also for Christianity. There's a Facebook page for the atheist movement of South Africa, Skeptic Magazine, that is uh, uh, he uh, headed by Michael Shermer, whom I will mention in a moment. Uh, it caught their attention. So Skeptic Magazine is a sort of upscale intellectual treatment of atheism uh, in its interaction with Christian culture especially in the, in the U.S., but not obviously confined to that. I saw an interesting testimony, or what some people sometimes refer to as anti-testimony, about a woman, in this case, a South African woman, who 
is uh, disabused of her Christian upbringing, raised a Christian. Uh, but then as she got uh, became an adult, she started looking into things on her own and got uh, dissatisfied with the Christian answers that she found. It was very interesting, a couple of things that she said, and this will be relevant, <clears throat> excuse me, this will be relevant before we're done. As, as she wrestled with her doubts, uh, I don't know how to say her name, uh, Nasifo, tried using the knowledge of science to make sense of God's existence, at least as a passive creator. That'll be relevant here in a moment. We talk about the intersection of science and the question of God's existence. But I thought this was uh, amusing, if nothing else. She goes on to say, to my greatest surprise, when I searched the internet and Googled my queries, I came across these websites that stated that Jesus never was never a historical figure. That was the first time I came across a publication that talked about Jesus as having never existed. <clears throat> well, I suspect if she kept looking, you're also going to find people that do not believe that humans ever landed on the moon. Uh, I just was on a website today with a guy who believes that Galileo was wrong and that the earth is the center of the solar system. And there's no end to the websites that say the Holocaust never happened in Germany and the earth is flat. In other words, uh, you can find all kinds of stuff on the internet. Some of it's true, some of it's not. And you have to be a little bit more discerning than just merely being impressed that it appeared on the internet as if that somehow. Uh, and it was very interesting. I heard an atheist on an atheist internet radio show and the atheist or agnostic or whatever he was, was being interviewed by atheists and atheists were calling in and making comments. When an atheist called in and made the comment, well, you know, after all, there's no real reason to think Jesus ever existed. The atheist guest said to his atheist friends, gentlemen, you need to retire that kind of talk. That's kooky talk. That's like saying the Holocaust never happened. No historian worth his weight it would ever doubt the existence of Jesus. But even if Jesus never did exist, that doesn't in and of itself have anything to do with the more fundamental question of whether God exists. Those are separate questions, and I would submit to you they're, de they're dealt with by different methodologies of, and tools and methods of inquiry. Let me just make sure we got our terms straight uh, so that uh, we're all on the same page as how I'm using terminology tonight. Uh, theism is just uh, the idea, well, first of all, it's based on the Greek word theos, which means God, translated God. It's the worldview that affirms the existence of God, the view that says God exists. Agnosticism, probably a familiar term, from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, with the negation, the alpha privative at the front, meaning not or no. It's the suspension of judgment on the question of whether God exists. It's the view that says, I don't know whether God exists. Maybe I don't know and, and you can't know, or I don't know, and maybe I will know, that kind of uh, sort of suspension of judgment. And then atheism, our topic tonight, is from the same Greek word, the os, for God, with that alpha privative, not. So it would be the worldview that denies the existence of God, the view that says God does not exist. Now, I mentioned the course that I teach at the seminary, Southern Evangelical Seminary, in, in, out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And when I teach this course on contemporary atheism, I divide it into three categories. And the th three categories are these, academic atheism, I actually do it in reverse order for obvious reasons that you'll see in a moment. But we deal with the atheism of the university professors, people like Michael Martin from uh, Boston University or J.L. Mackey from Oxford University, for example and others, and we deal with their more technical philosophical. Then we, dealt, we deal with the new atheism. There's some distinctive characteristics of the new atheism of Dawkin, Harris, Dennett, and Hitchens that, that sets them off in their manner than you would find, say, prior to that, before they came on the scene about 10, 12 years ago when they started really bursting onto the scene. And then popular atheism, which is our topic tonight. So what is popularity? What do I mean by it? Well, I don't mean popular in the sense that everybody likes it. Like say, hey, he's real popular at high school or, or, or university or whatever. Um, and it, it certainly doesn't mean unintelligent. So it's not like just a dumbed down and to the point of being uh, silly or facile or, or banal or whatever. Uh, what it means is that it's, a, it's a, an atheism where the writer either isn't uh, himself trained in philosophy to deal with it at a philosophical level. So he's dealing with it as a layman, if you will, or maybe he is trained, but he's writing something for people uh, who aren't trained. So typically popular level is going to be free of the technicalities of the specialized 
uh, sciences and, and, and uh, philosophy particularly to deal with. That's what I mean by popular. So a writer might just be a popular atheist by just by the nature, or he might be an academic who's written popular level. I mean, Einstein wrote a popular level of his theory of relativity. You may not know that. I got about halfway through the table of contents on that, and then I, was, I put it back on the shelf there. Uh, but he tried his best to put the cookies on the bottom shelf, as we'll say. So that's what I mean, sort of bumper sticker atheism, uh, uh, T-shirt atheism thing. I mean, and I'm not being critical of the fact that they've reduced these things to a bumper sticker or a T-shirt. Christians do the same thing. And they're fine. They're conversation starters. They're uh, ways to identify with, with a group and self-identify as being aligned with this ideology, that worldview, whatever. So I'm not at all critical of the fact that there are the, these kind of bumper sticker kind of atheist T-shirts and things. Uh, so who would be some of the people? Let me just mention some, and a few of them I'll revisit as we go along. But here are some of them, and some of them are academics that have written at a popular level, and some of them just are popular level themselves. People like Richard Dawkins and uh, Sam Harris, who wrote uh, The God Delusion and The End of Faith. Now, both of those guys are scholars. Uh, uh, but they've written in many respects for the general audience. Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett. Uh, these were the four horsemen of the new atheism. So you see an overlap between the new atheism as a cataloging and, a, and the popular atheism uh, and breaking the spell from Daniel Dennett. George Smith and Dan Barker. Uh, George Smith's book, Atheism, the Case Against God, is the best popular level atheist book I've ever read. In fact, it's a, I require it as a textbook in my course. So uh, if you're interested in a non-technical kind of treatment of the question of God's existence from an atheist perspective that's criticizing the arguments for God, then I highly recommend uh, George Smith's book. Not so much Dan Barker's book, although maybe it's good to read because Barker is, is popular in these circles. He does a lot of debates. I've debated him twice. And so it would be good to read his book to be informed. But he, he, he's, not as, um, he's not as conscientious about interacting with the data as somebody like a George Smith is, who really, I think, has, has the integrity to really try to do the best he can with, with what's it. Michael Shermer, I mentioned before, who publishes uh, Skeptic Magazine, and John Shook. I debated John Shook before, uh, How We Believe, uh, or The God Debates. Douglas Kruger was a classmate of mine in my PhD program at University of Arkansas. David Mills, John Loftus, and books that they've written. And there's others that we could name. So what are the arguments? Let me take a minute and a half, two minutes to just give you the arguments in one, one sentence each. We're only going to do one, two, or three, depending on how I manage my time from here on out. But what I do with the arguments for the popular atheism is I split those into three categories. Rhetorical arguments. These are arguments that play off of uh, uh, handy plays on words and things. They would be, for example, atheism is not a belief, rather it's the lack of a belief. We're all atheists about most gods. I'm just an atheist about one more God than you. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. This is one of my favorite. Science flies you to the moon. Religion flies you into buildings. And by the way, sometimes you'll see that the target of the atheist and that I'm dealing with may not necessarily just be Christianity. It may be more broadly religion in general, as this one is. Axial tilt, the reason for the season, which I like that one too. I think that's pretty clever. But in addition to rhetorical, I do... Uh, the scientific kind of oriented popular level arguments. Science is all we need to understand truths about reality, including whether God exists. Christianity has reacted against science because science has displaced man from the center of the universe, from the old Ptolemaic to the new Copernican solar system model, for example. Christianity has always stood against the advances of science. The case of Galileo is proof. So Christians have, have always been anti-science. The Bible was written by the same people who said the earth was flat. Uh, most scientists are atheists, therefore belief in God is not scientific. Virtual particles prove that something can come from nothing. If God created the biological complexity of the world, he must be no less complex. And then the third category are more philosophically oriented, still at the popular level, however. Things like question everything as a sort of an affront to sacred texts that claim to be inerrant and from, uh, from God. If everything needs a cause, then God needs a cause. Well, who made God or who designed the designer? Atheists can be moral without believing in God. Therefore, God is not necessary for morality. Christianity requires faith, which is belief in spite of the evidence. Why can there not be an infinite regress of causes in the past? 
can God make a rock too heavy for him to pick up? This is the first challenge I ever had when I became a Christian as a 16 year old. A friend of mine, or at least a person that I knew in school was an atheist. And he came up to me and said, can God make a rock too heavy for him to pick up? And he was trying to pose this paradox of omnipotence. Uh, why should we think that the cause of the universe is God, right? So why don't we try to take a few of these and uh, see how far we can get? Maybe one of each, if I've done my uh, time management well. How about this one? Because it, it needs to head off. And I've probably already generated some questions in some of the viewers. If you're an atheist and you're watching this, you may have already taken exception to stuff I said when I defined atheism to begin with. Because atheism, according to some, is not a belief. Rather, it's the lack of a belief. Just to prove to you that I'm not making it up, when George Smith debated Greg Bonson, it's an audio that you can find on the internet. It was a, a radio debate years ago. Uh, George Smith said that there is no atheistic worldview. Let's be clear about that. Atheism is simply the absence of belief in God. All right. And I have, and I will, you can get the PDF slide decks. And I want you to do that because for all of these points, I try to have copious examples to prove that what I'm ascribing to the atheist is, is actually what the atheists say. So you not only can get George Smith's opinion about that, but also uh, um, uh, uh, Keith Parsons, who is an atheist in the book, God Does Not Exist. Uh, Doug Kruger, whom I mentioned already in his book, What is Atheism? Michael Martin from Boston University uh, in his book, Atheism, a Philosophical Justification and others. But I won't take the time with the quotes. I'll, I'll just let you go get it off the PDF uh, slide deck there. But what's at stake in the definition? Why, why wrangle over the definition? Well, Dan Barker, I think, gives us insight into why this matters to both sides of this debate. In his book, Godless, he says this, Theists claim that there is a God. Atheists do not. In any argument, the burden of proof is on the one making the claim. So in other words, it's the idea that since we're not saying there isn't a God necessarily, we're just refraining from saying there is a God, then we're not really saying something that bears any responsibility to be proven. It's just merely the fact that I lack a belief. That's all you have to have in order to be atheist. And again, I've got some more quotes there. But let me respond to that right quick. First of all, I would submit to you for your consideration that this definition that atheism is merely the lack of a belief, does it, it conflicts with the standard academic definition of atheism. Now, people can decide to define themselves any way they want, but just be aware if you're going to take a word that's well established in a discipline like philosophy and then start to try to import other definitions for, it, for some kind of uh, practical reason to shift the burden of proof away from yourself so you don't really have to give an argument for your atheism, uh, then just be aware of the uh, difficulties that might ensue. So let me give you a few uh, appeals to authority. Paul Edwards, who is an atheist or was <clears throat> uh, a philosophical atheist, according to the most usual definition, an atheist is a person who maintains that there is no God. That is that the sentence God exists expresses a false proposition. Ernst Nagel, another atheist philosopher, atheism is not to be identified with sheer unbelief. A child who has received no religious instruction is not an atheist, for he is not denying any religious claims. A more contemporary would be Theodore Drange from West Virginia University. Is the proposition that God exists true or false? If you are a, the you are a theist, if, you, if and only if you say that the proposition is true, are probably true, and you are an atheist if you, if and only if you say that it is false or probably false, and you're an agnostic if and only if you understand what the proposition is, but resist giving either answer and support your resistance by saying the evidence is insufficient or something to that effect. And maybe even more formidable uh, voice of authority is Graham Oppie. Uh, when William Lane Craig was asked who he thought the most brilliant atheist right now, he said Graham Oppie is pretty hard to beat. Uh, that's pretty high regards from somebody like a William Lane Craig, at least in my opinion. Graham Oppie is a philosophy professor in Australia. Uh, properly, we should define theism as the view that there is at least one God and atheism as a view that there are no gods. And monotheism, a view that's exactly one, and we call that God with a capital G. Atheists then are people who believe that there are no gods and particularly in our context, believe that God does not exist. So that's my first objection to the definition. It conflicts, I would argue, with the standard academic definition. There's a second problem, though, 
in that it seems to entail a sort of absurdity. Because think about it. If atheism is the lack of a belief in God, well, then that means atheism could be true and God still exists because there still could have there still could be a God who exists and there be a lack of belief in God. In fact, that's actually the case, according to theists. Well, then what sense would it make to go, well, here's a book on atheism, and that book ends up being completely indifferent as to whether God really does exist. It's not a book about whether God exists. Don't you think that's what most people would expect if they picked up a book, a, a defense of atheism, and all the book did was defend the fact that there were people who lacked these beliefs. This guy lacks a belief. This guy lacks a belief. I've proven my atheism. And I think, well, that seems odd because you would think people that are advocating atheism are saying something stronger than merely that there are people who just happen to lack the belief. All right. Another uh, popular argument from the scientific category, is, uh, the one I pick, and I do this because of how much I've experienced in the marketplace and also in, the, in academia about the, the role that science plays in people's minds of how much authority it wields. Understandably so. And I, and I think I would like to consider myself scientifically savvy as a non-scientist. So what about the accusation that that's all we need to understand truths about reality, including whether God exists? I mean, you can see this and you'll see more pictures. I just included these two for tonight. Uh, but you can see these T-shirts, atheists in science we trust. Science is my religion. Uh, Richard Dawkins puts it this way. The presence or absence of a creative superintelligence, that's God is unequivocally a scientific question, even if it is not in practice or not yet a decided one. Now, hang on to these quotes because I'm going to come back to the ones that I put out for you as I try to deconstruct them. Um, Marsha McNutt, who was the head of the uh, 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 National Academy of Sciences, I think that's the name of the organization, one of the most prestigious academic scientific institutions, uh, she said this in an interview with National Geographic. She said, science is the method for deciding whether what we choose to believe has a basis in the laws of nature or not. So if you choose to believe X, then science will tell you whether X has a basis in the laws of nature or not. Daniel Dennett in his Breaking the Spell says, science and technology in the technology spawn has been explosively practical, but that doesn't mean it can cover all questions or serve all needs. Science does not have a monopoly on truth. Oh, wow, that almost sounds like I would some, something I would use in my favor against the atheist because Daniel Dennett is, a, is an atheist. But listen to how he goes on to qualify. Perhaps some cancer cures are miracles. If so, the only hope of ever demonstrating this to a doubting world would be by adapting the scientific method. That's the only way you could demonstrate whether there were miracles, according to Danny Bennett. Uh, Peter Atkins, whose debate with William Lane Craig is available on the Internet. <clears throat> and I was at this debate back in the late 90s uh, in the audience. He says, I believe that anything that has been reported reliably, and they're talking about these reports of miracles at Lourdes, anything can be interpreted scientifically within the framework of modern science. John Shook says it this way, philosophical naturalism undertakes the responsibility for elaborating a comprehensive and coherent worldview based on experience, reason, and science, and for defending, now notice, science exclusive right to explore and theorize about all of reality, presumably including the question of whether God exists. So how would I respond to that? Let's take them one at a time real quickly. Dawkins and his God delusion to revisit, uh, presence or absence of a creative super tells is unequivocally a scientific question. Now I want you to compare that statement with something he said much earlier, saying the same thing. So it's not two different things he's saying. He's just saying the same thing in two different ways. In his book, The Blind Watchmaker, he said this, unlike some of his theological colleagues, Bishop Montefiore is not afraid to state that the question of whether God exists is a definite question of fact. And in the context, he's just celebrating the fact that he met a religious uh, leader in the UK who wasn't postmodern, that thought, well, there's a God for you and not a God for me. And Dawkins goes, no, there either is or isn't a God. It's either true there's a God or it's false there's a God. So when you compare these two, uh, it, it's, it, it, it is a definite question of fact. I think Dawkins is exactly right. And I share the contempt of postmodernism that, that he has, this sort of unwarranted relativism, right? I, I, I'm the same way. But whether that question of fact is a scientific question, now that has to be defended. 
I mean, the first one have to be defended too, but I agree with Bill Dawkins, so I'm not going to quarrel with it. But whether a given question is or isn't a scientific question is something that itself has to be defended whether that's the case. Well, how would you do that? Let me see if I can tease it out a little bit more with another quote from Dawkins. There is an answer to every such question in the context he's talking about God and more narrowly about miracles. There is an answer to every such question, whether or not we can discover it in practice, and it's strictly a scientific answer. The methods we should use to settle the matter in the unlikely event that relevant evidence could ever be available would be purely and entirely scientific methods. So just ask yourself, and I do this with audiences sometimes, if, if there's interaction, what are the methods, according to Dawkins, uh, 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 that he proposes? Well, they're purely and entirely scientific methods. That's what he's proposing for questions about God and miracles and, 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 and related kind of questions. So according to Dawkins, should scientific methods be used only for certain kinds of questions or for every kind of question? Well, for every such question in the context in which he's talking. It's going to have this broad breadth, breadth of uh, applicability there. My question to Dawkins is, and for you to consider, is, is the statement Dawkins just made, is that statement pu purely and entirely provable by scientific methods? And I would submit to you, absolutely not. There is no scientific experiment or observation that you could make, the conclusion of which would be this statement. Right? So. If that statement is not provable, then what is the method that you would use? What is this method? Uh, since the statement is not, as I would allege, and I would try to argue that if we had more time, what is the method? Well, lo and behold, that method is a philosophical method, whatever that looks like. But what I'm suggesting to you and, and offering you to consider is the very discussion about what kinds of questions uh, range over what aspects of the real world, that very enterprise is philosophy. That's what philosophy's always been since we first started calling a discipline philosophy, all the way back to Thales when the first nascent forms of philosophical thinking uh, were, were, were going on. But if there is a such thing as a philosophical method, which apparently Dawkins doesn't even believe, and, and in my opinion, apparently he doesn't even know what that is, not even aware of it, but I would say, of course, there is that. Uh, then if there is a such thing, then why can't you use that method about God and miracles? In fact, that's exactly what I would argue. I was in a debate at Georgia State University with an atheist. On, and I was making this point. Hey, this is a philosophical question. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And this Q&A, a gentleman got up and he said, well, who are you to say there's a philosophical question? And I was sort of taken aback by the question because it, it struck me. Suppose we were talking about certain trees, whether this particular species of trees was deciduous or evergreen. And I said, well, you know, that's really a question for the botanist. That's a botanical question. What, sen what sense would it make somebody go, well, who are you to say that it's a botanical question? I go, it's not like that. It's not like that we went out and picked a bunch of questions and then went to the bot botanist and said, OK, guys, these are the questions you guys get to answer. No, it's the other way around. The questions that people deal with when they deal with plants, we call that botany, not the other way. So it's not like we picked out God and other things and said, hey, now the philosopher, okay, that's going to be ours, gang. It's the other way around. It's that's the questions and the methods that the philosophers have always and still do today use to deal with these kind of questions. Now, why does that matter practically? I'll say this, but I don't have time to defend it maybe during the Q&A. And even then, probably wouldn't have time. But in my experience, having been a professor for, for decades and teaching on atheism and teaching Christian apologetics, uh, it's very hard to find a, a contemporary popular atheist who's not an academic uh, like a Michael Martin or Theodore Drange or uh, J.L. Mackey or whomever that knows anything about how this conversation about God's existence has gone on for 2,300 years in Western civilization. They don't even know how the conversation been going on. You read Dan Barker's book, you, you'd think that nobody ever asked whether God existed until about 1960, maybe. And then they started asking the question. You go, and I'm not suggesting, well, if you just knew how this question had been dealt with for 2,300 years, you'd be a theist. I'm not saying that because lots of academics that try to deal with it historically are still academic atheists. And I respect that. And I also respect their integrity that they're actually interacting with the conversation with the tools and methods and protocols of the discipline that's most relevant to the nature of the question. Unlike a, a Richard Dawkins, who is a consummate scientist, but it's a failure of his academic 
duty. It's dereliction of academic duty for him to write a book on the existence of God. It's as ridiculous as me trying to write a book on evolution, the evolution delusion by Richard Howe. What does Richard Howe know about this? Nothing. I'm not a biologist. I'll let those guys debate. What about Marsha McNutt? Well, science is a method for deciding whether what we choose to believe is a basis in laws of nature or not. Presumably, Marsha McNutt believes that statement. So what's the scientific method she used to decide whether the statement she just made didn't have any, did or didn't have any basis in the laws of nature? Now, she's going to say, well, maybe some of the things we believe don't have a basis in laws of nature. Okay. Uh, if they don't have a basis in laws of nature, then on what basis do they have, which never comes up in her article. Uh, further, exactly what laws of nature could possibly be the nature basis for that kind of belief? And the implication you get from the article is, if the laws of nature aren't enough to be the basis of any given belief, you don't need to have that belief, including the belief whether, uh, uh, whether God exists or not. So I would submit to you that her statement is self-refuting, because she, in effect, uh, uh, is allowing for the fact that the very statement she made has no basis whatsoever in the laws of nature, while at the same time implying, at least, that if your belief doesn't have a basis in laws of nature, you shouldn't have that belief. What about Dennett? And his uh, the scientific method. Well, you asked Dennett, uh, what argument did he give to support that claim? The only hope of demonstrating that there are miracles is the scientific method. Did you use the scientific method to defend the truth of that claim? Well, no, of course not. He didn't. That's a philosophical claim. OK. And Daniel Dennett is a philosopher. Maybe you go, of course, it's a philosophical claim. Richard, I'm, I'm a philosopher. I know that. OK. If, if, if you're a philosopher and you know that, then why aren't you allowing for the fact that maybe the question of whether God exists and miracles are possible is also a philosophical claim? Why, why do you just relegate it to the discipline of science without really giving any argument uh, there? So uh, I already answered my question. It's a philosophical question. What about Atkins? Uh, well, can Atkins' statement, quote, be interpreted scientifically within the framework of modern science? I think that's the wrong question to ask. I don't think that's the wrong question because I think you could. You could, in effect, interpret any statement with any framework. I mean, you could take a statement and go, can you interpret that statement in the, in the framework of Lord of the Rings? You'd probably imagine what Frodo might think about what you said and whether that has any implications of the impact of the ring. Or, yeah, you could probably do that. That's not the question. The question I think to ask is, can Atkins' statement be correctly interpreted scientifically within the framework of modern science? And again, it's just a no. It cannot be because the subject matter with which you're dealing is not a scientific question. It is a philosophical question. And then this is probably the most surprising of all to me. Here is a philosopher who's in effect saying that science is the only thing that can deal with all of reality. Well, why do you why did you get a PhD in philosophy if it doesn't have anything to do with reality? I mean, is Shook's statement a part of reality? Yeah, it's a real statement he made. Well, then what scientific method could he possibly use to prove the statement? There isn't one. They're all committing the same fallacy in, in, in logic known as the selection effect. Or it goes by lots of names, but one of them is the selection effect. If you drag a net through the water of a lake in order to gather data about the relative sizes of the marine life, invariably any life in the lake that's either too small or too large to be in the net won't be it won't be caught in the net, it won't be part of your data, right? So in other words, the net is illicitly perhaps selecting the data, and then you take the data and analyze it, and then you make uh, global comments about life in the lake. Well, you can't do that. It's like searching for seashells at the uh, water's edge with a metal detector. There aren't any seashells. They don't exist. I'm a seashell atheist. Why? Because I've got the best metal detectors money can buy. Well, seashells aren't made out of metal. They're made out of calcium carbonate. You need a calcium carbonate detector. That's what you need. Now, again, if a person wants to say, well, I'm not so sure there is a philosophical method or I don't think it's relevant, those are fair questions. They never get brought up. That's what frustrates me as a, as a philosopher and a Christian apologist. They never even get brought up in most of the popular level stuff. You just never see these guys even entertaining these. Um, so in effect, they're the, 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 they're completely missing the evidence because they're scandalized by their presupposition. I heard a great joke and I modified it for my points here. So some guy says, so what good is philosophy? And I said, I don't know. What good is science? He goes, well, science, ah, now you're doing philosophy. As soon as you start to tell me what you think science is, you're not speaking as a scientist. You're speaking as a philosopher of science. 
so to speak. All right, do we have time for one more, Danielle? I'm going to make sure I don't abuse my time. If I do it real quick, I'm wasting time sure. asking you whether I... Yeah, yeah, go for All it, right. please. Go All right, for go it. for it. Got one, one more to do, because I'm, I'm waiting till the, I get to the point where I do balloon animals. That really pushes it across the finish line when you see my balloon animals for theism. All right, what about a philosophical argument? Here's one I hear a lot. If everything needs a cause, then God needs a cause. So the cosmological argument doesn't work. Dan Barker says, says this, everything had a cause and everything is, uh, every cause is the effect of previous cause. Something must have started all. God is the eternal first cause, the creator, sustainer life. The major premise of this argument, everything had a cause, is contradicted by the conclusion that God did not have a cause. You can't have it both ways. If everything had to have a cause, then there could not be a first cause. So he goes on, the old cosmological argument claimed that since everything has a cause, there must be a first cause, an unmoved mover. Notice this, today, no theistic philosophers defend that primitive line because if everything needs a cause, so does God. George Smith says the same thing. If every, every existing thing has a cause and every cause must be caused by a prior cause, which in turn must be caused by a still prior cause and so on until we reach one of two conclusions. Either we have an endless change of causes and infinite regress or there exists a first cause of being that does not require causal explanation, which again would contradict the first premise, which, which is what they would point out. Sam Harris makes the same uh, mistake. Everything that exists has a cause. Space and time exist. Space and time must therefore have been caused by something that stands outside of space and time. And the only thing that transcends space and time and yet retains the power to create is God. But if God uh, didn't need a cause, that would contradict the first premise again. Daniel Dennett makes the same mistake. I'm giving you a lot of quotes deliberately for reasons that will be obvious as I finish this up. The cosmological argument, which in its simplest terms states that since everything must have a cause, the universe must have a cause, namely God, doesn't stay simple for very long. Uh, and so I'm just, just to reiterate that uh, uh, this line here, just don't forget what Barker said about no theistic philosopher today. Michael Ruse, I had the pleasure of debating Michael Ruse on our campus uh, not too long ago. Again, we find an argument with somewhat different forms, but of our purposes, it's enough to focus on the central inference. Everything has a cause. There must therefore be a cause of the world. This is, or we call this, God. Manuel Velasquez in his, uh, his philosophy book, the second objection to the cosmological argument is that the, its conclusion is contradicted by its premise. To illustrate, Aquinas insists that every event must have a cause. But is this so? Why stop with God? The notion of an uncaused cause seems to contradict the assumption that everything needs a cause. So just notice, by the way, before we leave him, first of all, even if Aquinas argued that every event must have a cause, right, as he does there, God's not an event in Aquinas. So even if it was true that every event has a cause, it wouldn't follow that God needs a cause for Aquinas because he doesn't think God is an event, okay? Second, though, notice in the, his misconstruing Aquinas' argument, he, he illicitly shifts from every event to everything. Notice that he does that. Every event must have blah, 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 blah. Everything has a cause. Well, there are more things than events, aren't there? Um, and last, even if one argued that every event must have a cause, this is not equivalent to saying that everything has a cause. Uh, 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 Robin Le Pointe de Voix, I practiced that. It's hard for me for uh, English as a second language because I was born in the southern part of the US. <laughs> So they tease us about how bad our English is here. Uh, this book is actually on philosophy of religion. And what does he say? We, we shall take a look at three versions of the cosmological argument. First, I call the basic cosmological argument, because the other two are modification. It goes like this. Anything that exists has a cause of its existence. Nothing can be the cause of its own existence. The universe exists. Therefore, the universe is cause of its own existence, which lies outside the universe. Although no one has defended a cosmological argument precisely in this form, note that. It provides a useful stepping stone to other more sophisticated versions. So what can I say in response to conclude this? <clears throat> Let me say it this way. Among philosophers of history, throughout history, there is no version of any argument for the existence of God that says everything must have a cause. That, that, that argument doesn't exist in the literature by the theists who are making the argument. Nobody makes that argument. I'll tell you where that ever got started, that myth. But you've got people who are scholars. Well, since of cosmological arms and everything, give me one person that says that. Nobody says that. All right. Uh, there is a version that says everything that begins to exist has a cause. That's, that's a version. Okay. That's what the Kalam cosmological argument is, which, by the way, is not Aquinas' argument. 
but it's an argument that I, that I think is sound. And I, I did my master's thesis on this argument when I read Craig's book, tried to defend it against objections I was encountering outside of his book after he published his book, additional objections and things. So I think it's a good argument. Aquinas didn't think so. But that wasn't his argument anyway. So when he talks about this cannot go into infinity in his arguments, he's not talking a Kalam argument. There is a version that says that every contingent being must have a cause. Whatever a contingent being is, that would be Aquinas' argument, whatever that means. Uh, a great resource I would highly recommend is Gavin Kerr's book, Aquinas' Way to God, The Proof in the Deanta Essentia. Deanta Essentia is on being in essence, one of Aquinas' earliest work, a little tiny booklet almost on the basics of metaphysics. And the re another reason I like Gavin Kerr is at least when he first wrote the book, uh, he had hair down to his shoulder blades and, and he was wearing a Frodo shirt. I figured I got to read a book by a guy that does that because I vicariously have long hair. In fact, I vicariously have just hair through other people. So I love people because I was a long hair when I was at university back in 19. <coughs> All right. So I highly recommend that. So uh, Jeffrey J. Louder, who was an, uh, a prominent internet atheist presence. He's one of the first internet atheists of note and, and created internet infidels, or at least he was one of the movers and shakers. So no small voice on the internet of atheism. He said, no respectable theologian or theistic philosopher has ever made the claim, everything has a cause. Yet various new atheists have proceeded to attack that straw man of their own making. I remember when reading The Gone Delusion by Richard Dawkins, where he attacked that straw man and cringing there are many different cosmological arguments for God's existence, and none of them rely upon the stupid claim that everything needs a cause. Where does that come from? Well, I think most proximately, it probably comes from Bertrand Russell and his uh, essay, Why I'm Not a Christian. You can get the slide deck. What I do is I go and give my argument historically where I think the mistake crept in. And you say, well, where did Russell get it? Uh, I think what Russell did is he misquotes Hume in his dialogues concerning natural religion. Because what Hume says is that everything needs a cause or a reason. Well, there's a difference between a cause and a reason. And the principle of sufficient reason isn't necessarily inconsistent with the idea that God doesn't need a cause. It just means there's a reason for God. He's not a brute fact in classical theism. There is a reason that God exists. But that's not the same as there being a cause. So my, my theory is Hume says everything needs a reason or cause. Or he says it through one of the interlocutors in his dialogue. Russell picks up on that, but then he either misquotes it or hastily reads it. He makes it everything needs a cause and leaves out the reason. Then Russell ended up being tremendously influential in 20th century uh, uh, academic atheism and now by popular atheism stuff. One last one, though, that is just a shame. Uh, Greg Bonson, of all people, a PhD in philosophy who is a Christian and believes in the existence of God, said this in his book. Um, How should we understand the fundamental premise in the cosmological argument? Everything has a cause, or every object has its origin, or better, every event has a cause. If this is taken as a universal metaphysical principle, then the embarrassing conclusion reached by the apologist would be that God, too, has a cause or origin. You know why no apologist is embarrassed because no apologist ever made that argument. It would be. That's exactly why they don't make it, because that would be embarrassing, because it'd be a contradictory argument. Everything needs a cause, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but God doesn't need a cause. Well, then everything doesn't need a cause. All right. Well, uh, in the deck, too, you can get a suggested resources. I won't take time to do that because we want to have time for Q, uh, but we won't have time for A. We'll just do Q and then call it a night to get a whole bunch of questions in there. All right. So let me stop share because uh, you don't, you want to see me more closely. I'm grinning. I'm grinning for the for the stills. All right, Dr. Moritz, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, um, Richard. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with the with um, this one from. Uh, well, I don't know from who it is, actually. I'm just going to read you the question. Richard, all right, okay. You can fire away. So first of all, how do you deal with the false. argument? From... Yes, that is oh, false. <laughs> that's I it. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. All go right, ahead. So, um, how do you deal with the argument from Occam's razor? Atheism is a simpler explanation than theism. 
Well, uh, solipsism is a simpler explanation than atheism. So solipsism is the belief that you are the only thing in existence and everything else in reality is just in your mind. So if simplicity, meaning the fewer, the, the least amount of elements in your model, if that's what a person thinks Occam Razor is, which it's not, then we should all just be solipsists, which is ironic since if, since if solipsism is true, there wouldn't be we all. There would just be the one guy in whose mind everybody else is. So, so but Occam's Razor is not the simpler is better. It's, it's really, you should not compound causes beyond necessity. That's what the Occam's razor means. So all theism is doing, in effect, is, is uh, showing how God is the cause of some effect, namely the, the creation. And the arguments try to show how, that, and that, how you make that argument. So it's, it, it has nothing to do with whether, well, given that the coronavirus is the cause of COVID-19, it wouldn't make sense for somebody to say, well, let's just get one virus. Why do we have to have so many viruses? It's a lot simpler to just have a single virus and say, that's the cause of all disease. You go, well, we're not interested in having the fewest number of viruses in our catalog. We're interested in having the, the greatest amount of explanations by, way, by means of causes. And if you need to posit a cause to explain some effect, then, but you know, it, it doesn't contradict Occam's razor anyway, because the razor says, don't necessitate or, or don't compound causes beyond necessity. So that's theism is not doing that. Cool. But it's a good question, though. Okay. Uh, next one. What are what are some truths uh, that science cannot account for? Well, it's interesting because this question actually came up, some version of it, in Bill Craig's debate with Peter Atkins. It is a uh, precious moment. So I encourage everyone to find that on the internet and watch the exchange. I will have to warn you. There's a my, my then girlfriend, now wife, and I were in the audience, and there's a, there's a point in the video where they're right on, a, a, on her face, which is really good. Then they back up real slowly, and I'm sitting next to her trying to pretend like we don't notice a big camera. So I just want to warn you, you might want to hide the children when, uh, when it pans back and I'm in, the, I'm, in the cam I'm in the camera. But this came up because Bill kept making this point about things that are about reality that science can assail. And Atkins said, well, give me something that, that it can. And Bill said, I'll give you five things that it can. Uh, it can't account for the laws of logic and mathematics. It needs the laws of logic and mathematics to be science. So you can't use science to prove those laws because it uses logic and mathematics in any proof that it gives of anything. It can't prove truths about metaphysics like universals. Uh, you talk about uh, humans, like in the Nuremberg trials when the Nazis were were indicted for crimes against humanity. You go, what's a humanity? And if you don't think humanity, I mean, I'm not a humanity, I'm a human, and you are humans, and all of us individually are humans, but what's humanity? It's what philosophers call a universal. It's either real in some sense or not. If you think it's real in some sense, you're probably going to be thinking along the lines of either Plato or Aristotle. And then if you're a Christian, you might qualify that with Aquinas's uh, opinion. If you think it's not real, then how could you commit a crime against it? We need to apologize to the Nazis for, for the indictment in the Nuremberg trial. No, people understand concepts that pick out something about uh, reality that the philosophers have identified as universal. Uh, causality is a philosophical concept that, that I think science can't, can't account for. It needs causality in order to be science. Uh, I think it can account for certain metaphysical truths about goodness that entail morality, that they're not reducible to the categories of science. And then the last one that Bill said uh, was that science itself is not, is not provable by science. Um, there are assumptions in science that have to be made. The example he gives is the speed of light in, uh, in uh, unidirectional speed of light. You, 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 they have to posit that as, as an invariant for the physics, at least in relativity theory. Now, I don't understand what that means, but I understand positing as an invariant, I don't know what that means, but I don't understand the relativity. So right there, you've got a, a battery of things that science can assail. And then when it gets into more details about metaphysics, I could give you even more or less the distinction between essence and existence, the distinction between form and matter, the distinction between substance and accident, for example, or three more in metaphysics that, that are uh, unassailable and, and, and unaddressable by the scientific method or any scientific method. All right, thanks, Richard. Uh, next, next question. Um, 
What is the most challenging atheistic argument that you have come across? Uh, for me, I think the one that uh, that would be the most challenging, I, I'd have to think about who I might have said it to me. I may have been stuff that I encountered in the literature is anyone who tries to, uh, I, I, let me pick the right verb, convince his hearer that logic is not applicable to reality, the sort of postmodern thing, that there are no objective truths in the, in the you know, that, that truth is really power, as, as Michel Foucault would say, for example, uh, that, that or now what's happening in the States, and I don't know if this is uh, injuring uh, South Africans, but in the States now, being logical and reasonable and depending on evidence is now considered white supremacists in the U.S. And people are on a campaign in the universities and schools to eradicate argument, logic, and reason. Well, anybody that, any atheist who said, well, reality is just, we're all in the matrix. You can't really know reality. That, I think, would if, they, if I got convinced of that, I'm, then, of course, I wouldn't think there's a God. I just think I'm in the matrix or whatever. Uh, but I've never heard any atheist arguments other than something like that that I think poses a, a, a challenge to, to my theism. And, and the, and, but the reason for that, Danielle, you know, because you and I've spent hours talking about these kind of issues, is because I'm a classical theist. I'm a Thomist. And a lot of the objections that I encounter in the literature that we're studying in my class are objections that are, are I can't think of an exception, that are aimed right at the contemporary analytic philosophical theistic personalism kind of theism. That's not me. Paradox of omnipotence or paradox of omniscience or, you know, these kind of things. They're all coming out of a view of the nature of God that wasn't the view of God that Christians have had for most of our history. I'm not saying it's true because of that. I'm just saying, as a matter of fact, you don't see this sort of classical view of God's attributes fade until about the 17th onset of the 17th century post Descartes. So, you know, but I, but I read atheist literature. I watch atheist YouTubes all the time. And if anybody has any that thinks are, are formidable, then I would love that. I would love to re read that and, and, and see if I could rise to the challenge to try to answer it. Cool, thanks Richard. All right, um, how do you know that what you believe is true? With atheism, the lack of belief view is just a healthy suspension of judgment regarding questions we don't have certain answers to. Yeah, and that's completely fair. That's agnosticism though, that's not atheism. All, all they've done is just basically taken the definition of agnosticism and just called that soft atheism. And then Ma Martin breaks it up between hard and soft atheism, and then positive and negative. So he has four different categories that he unpacks in, in uh, his article in the Cambridge Companion to Atheism, which is a, another textbook I'm using this semester. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there are lots of things that I'm not sure what I believe about that. I mean, I could think, or don't know enough to know whether I believe it or not. And especially in the technical sciences, I, I couldn't referee most debates that scientists have about stuff. Even if I had an opinion, it wouldn't be particularly informed. So the specter of, hey, there are some things we're just not sure about is, is not really a serious challenge to the idea that, well, there are some things that I can't fail to know. Uh, I don't think, I think there are truths about reality that no human could fail to know unless some of his faculties are compromised. You can't fail to know the sky is blue when you're outside on a sunny, clear day. Nobody can fail to know that unless they don't know what the word blue means, or they're blind, or they're cognitively compromised. I understand that. But I just mean a normal functioning human, most of the things in the physical world, I think we, we almost couldn't fail to know them. We make a mistake here or there, but it doesn't compromise. I know the difference between a tree and a cow out in the pasture. I'm not, I'm not running around wondering if I'm in the matrix. And I have a blog on this, by the way, called How Do I Know That I Know? So if you go to richardghow.com and click on blog, it'll take you to my blog and I blog every other third Haley's comment. So I just recently did it because I missed the last Haley's comment. So now I've got, you know, three or 27 more Haley's comments, then I'll blog again. All right. But I deal with this sort of, and that wasn't necessarily the question, but it's, it's, it, you can see this question from that question, namely, you know, how do you know anything? How can you be sure of anything? How do you know you're not in the matrix? Sort of Cartesian uh, question uh, that, that he asked. He asked the question about the matrix, but it wasn't matrix then. It's a demon. 
so I don't, I'm, uh, hopefully I'm doing the question justice uh, to acknowledge that, yeah, there's lots of things that I think I don't know for sure. God's not, God's existence is not one of them, however. Cool. So, so for those of you who are wondering, um, like you have, uh, you have, um, R Richard just referred to his website again, richardghow.com. The G stands for good looking. That's the, uh, that's the G. So don't forget that in the. <laughs> in the ding, 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 ding. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So, um, for some reason, Danielle, when I do that and, and I'm speaking at conferences, the whole audience yes. bursts out in laughter. I've never understood why. I look in the mirror and go, <laughs> what's funny about that? <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm also puzzled by that. Yeah. It's just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, how do you overcome Hume's problem of induction, especially since this presents a serious problem for theistic arguments for God's existence? I love this question, okay? I wish we had time to, to explore it. Um, in my criticisms, in the context of my criticisms of presuppositionalism as an apologetic method, uh, but, but, but the point has more to do than just the debate between classical and presuppositional apologists. But it comes up more often in that context. Uh, I've heard very often and read very often where presuppositionalists will offer their presuppositionalism as the only solution to a handful, I, I think I'm up to eight now, a handful of philosophical problems. Only one of the eight I can identify going all the way back to the ancient Greeks as the problem, the one in the many. Otherwise, every one of the problems that they think the eighth, their presuppositionalism can solve are problems created by modern contemporary philosophy. Hume's philosophy is in the context of the empiricist tradition from Locke through Barclay and the rationalist tr tradition Spinoza, Leibniz, or Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz. Whatever that means, that's his milieu. That's who he's trying to challenge. And in effect, Hume is saying, given the empiricism, John Locke, George Barclay, you cannot sh substantiate the, the uh, uniformity of nature and, and by implication, the inductive reason. By your rationalism, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, you can't do it either. That's the, the bankruptcy of these traditions in which Hume finds himself, right? And so he just throws that out. Now, Hume's solution is you don't need philosophy for any of these things because they're psychologically grounded, not, not philosophically grounded. Kant thinks you need something more substantive. He offers a solution that ends up being worse than the disease. Here's my response. You, you'll notice in the history of philosophy, you don't have a problem of induction, so to speak, uh, until about the 17th century. Why? Because of the metaphysics. Aristotle, how did Aristotle justify induction? Because Aristotle and then Aquinas would say, look, there are metaphysical truths about physical objects that I can come to know uh, by means of my empirical experience. One of those has to do with natures, with a thing having a nature. I know what a human nature is. So if somebody said, hey, there's this guy in China, I'd know exactly who, what he's talking about. He didn't say anything particular about it. Didn't say whether it was male or female or tall, short, or didn't even say whether he was Chinese. Just said he's in China. Yet my intellect is able to identify that as a human because of I understand the nature. Well, that's a philosophical dispute if there are their natures, and that would be something fun to try to defend. But it's because of the metaphysics of nature and then what can be known from that, that you don't have a problem of induction. It's very interesting. I'll, I'll finish with this because I, I have a, uh, a, a bad habit of taking too long answering questions. When, when, when um, um, Greg Bonson debated Gordon Stein, we, we listened to that debate and several other debates in, in my apologetic systems course. And so he challenges Stein. Well, how, your, your materialist atheism can't account for the principles of uh, induction and, and the uh, uniformity of nature. But of course, Bonson says we can because of we presuppose the God who made you know, that kind of argument. So in his closing, or, or after Bonson threw down the challenge, Stein's response was, well, I know, for example, that nature is going to behave the way it behaves because of, uh, but because of the nature of the electron. I know what an electron is, you know, so it's not going to change charge in the future, blah, blah, blah. And that's how he did it. Bonson in his closing says this, he goes, Gordon Stein thinks that he, you know, he's got the uniform in nature because he knows, for example, the nature of an electron. And, and Bonson just goes, he doesn't know the nature of an electron. 
And it, I wish I could have been there and go, how do you know he doesn't know the nature of an electron? You just, you just blew that out as if, well, obviously Gordon Stein doesn't know the nature of an electron. Maybe he does. What's his argument for knowing the nature of theirs? That never came up. Bonson didn't seem to even think it was worthy to even ask, well, how do you tell me how you think you know the nature of electron? And perhaps, and I suspect Bonson would have been able to show, well, given your take on reality, your atheist materialism, that's not going to give you natures. And I would agree with Bonson because natures are metaphysical, right? So whatever that means, but it's a, it's a metaphysical aspect of a thing. So I would have picked a different example than electron, but I would have made the same arguments. I, I know lots of things about the future based on what I know about the present because of the, the fact that way. Now, for me as a Christian, I was, it's that way because God made it. But I can know that it's that way, irrespective of whether I think God made it or not. In fact, I can't fail to know that. Nobody can fail to know what I mean when I say, I got a tree in my backyard. They know what I mean. They know what a tree is. They know what human is. So I think that's how you, uh, hum, uh, 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 um, John Nassus in his book, Being in Some 20th Century Thomas, has a brilliant refutation of Hume. Because Hume is basing his argument in the, in the, in the grounding of phenomena, what you see, to hear, taste, touch, or smell. Uh, you see white, you see a piece of chalk rolling across the floor, and you see rolling. And Nassus goes, that's not what I see. I see chalk that is white and that is rolling. Well, what's the difference between chalk, white, rolling that are all on the same plane in Hume? What's the difference between that and chalk as a substance? white as an accident and rolling as an action. Well, if you if you let that be and unpack that, then you're going back to a more classical understanding of these things that prevents all of these problem of induction and problem of the one and the many and these kind of things for you I mean coming up in the in the first place. A lot of that needs to be defended, I realize, but that's a short answer, believe it or not. <laughs> Oh, you're muted, Daniel. There we go. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Okay, so uh, the next question is, how does someone respond? So this is, I think, asking for some elaboration on something you've dealt with in your presentation. Um, how does someone respond to the atheist that claims that atheism is just a lack of belief that God exists? Because from this, they assert that the theist has the burden of proof. Exactly. So the, 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 the way I would respond was the way I did in the presentation to say that's not the standard academic definition, which for whatever that's worth, they may not care that the, that that's, is or isn't the standard definition. It's a change. Um, and, and, I, and then, of course, the conundrum of, well, then if atheism is just merely the lack of the belief, then atheism is absolutely true because there's lots of lacks of belief in God. But it has nothing to do with whether theism is true or false, which is interesting that people would be atheists and have a version of atheism that is completely indifferent as to whether God exists or not. That just seems odd to me. The thing that I didn't say in the presentation, um, let me see if I can wrap my mind uh, uh, around what, I think uh, I may have lost my train of thought on that. So maybe those two, uh, two will, oh, I know what it is. Uh, and, it, and that is a discussion about this whole issue of burden of proof. Um, it depends on a lot of other variables as to whether any given claim bears a burden of proof. If, if, if I'm living in, uh, uh, you know, in the, uh, the, the mountain peaks of South Africa and I make some claim about snow, I probably don't have a burden of proof to prove to people in the country that there's snow. But there may be places on earth, perhaps some isolated tribes in the Brazilian jungle where my wife grew up as a missionary kid, that if you tried to tell them there's this white stuff that falls from the sky, you would have a burden of proof. Well, what, what is it? What is it about snow? Does it have a burden of proof or not? Well, it depends. It depends on who your audience is and who your context is. So it, it just, the, the, it's, it's just much more complicated than just merely. Now, in formal debate, which I've judged before, in forensic debate, the debates are, are not, they debate proposition statements. And then the yes, by rule, has the 100% of the burden of proof. And the no has no burden of proof. So if the yes gives five arguments for their yes answer and the, and the no answers the five arguments, the no wins in formal debate. They don't have to give an argument for the no. If they just answer the arguments for the yes, they win. But that's formal debate when you're debating a proposition. 
when we're having conversations in the marketplace of ideas, we're not constrained by the rules of formal debate. And for that matter, we're not debating necessarily a proposition. In fact, every time I've debated the existence of God, I've insisted on debating a question. Does God exist? That way, there won't, we won't be wasting time on debating about the debate. And we can spend our time debating whether God exists instead of debating whether we should debate whether God exists or debate whether God means or atheism means this. Well, that's kind of siphoning off time that we, we have. So, um, you know, in some context, maybe, maybe it would need a burden. But even still, I'm happy to bear a burden of proof. I'm happy to do that. And I think I don't really know any atheist, perhaps, unless they're a precept, unless they're a, um, not even a presupposition, a, a, a reformed epistemology, a Plantingian, who would, who would balk at the uh, obligation to, to uh, meet some burden of proof. Uh, for his own philosophical reasons, would Plantinga uh, do that? So I'm, I'm happy to take a burden. I try to give my arguments. Um, and, I, and, I'm, and if the atheist just wants to deal with my arguments, fine. But I would challenge the atheist on some things to say, how do you account for this if you, if it's, you don't like the way I do kind of stuff. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Richard. I just quickly want to um, ask another thing about the problem of induction. This is just, um, or, or make an observation. You, you, you need to correct me if I'm wrong, though. But isn't, isn't, it any, isn't it the case that any conclusion or any argument with the conclusion, all inductive arguments yields only probability? Isn't that in itself like a, that, that argument will be, Dependent. <laughs> that, is brilliant. that is brilliant. I love that. Exactly. So, the indictment of inductive reasoning needs the viability of deductive reasoning to launch the indictment. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So that's because yeah, how could because how can you go? Well, how do you know all how do you know there aren't inductive reasonings that follow absolutely? Well, they, you know, they haven't experienced every inductive. No, they understand yes. the category of inductive. Well, that's a universal. And so because the intellect is able to understand the universal, it knows when certain particulars are or are not members of that, what contemporary philosophy calls class. But I think it's more than just a logic category. It's a metaphysical category, at least with natural objects like trees and people. I love that. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use that. I'm gonna, I'll, put, I'll footnote you. I'll have it at the bottom of the screen, a little little, you know, the date and time for more, and I'll give them your email address. You want more on this? <laughs> email this guy. No, I think that's um, hilarious. I, I love that response. Well, um, I don't think you need to footnote, footnote me, though, because I've heard it from someone else, but okay. I'm actually, well, just, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, cool. it's, uh, it's, I think it's great. Uh, and it's, it's, a ver it's a version of the, uh, when the atheist says, well, you can't prove a negative. Uh, well, you, can you prove that you can't prove a negative? Because that's a negative. There, are, you know, there are no provable negative statements. You know, <laughs> in other words, in fact, in categorical logic, you could take any negative and and apply legitimate uh, logic procedures to it and convert it into a positive statement. But because uh, you can just move the negation of the subject or the negation of the predicate uh, back and forth. You know that uh, all cats are mammals. Uh, uh, no non-mammals are cats would follow by um, uh, aversion, I think, because I have to remember it's been a long time since I've done logic in class. But I think it's the, uh, 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 no, that's actually a contraposition. No, that's, uh, never mind. It's some logic thing. I have to look it up. That's the cool. contrary. That's what it is. Okay, cool. All Thanks are, no you. are. Top of uh, Aristotle's square of opposition. I'm rusty yes. in my logic terminology. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next question isn't the Kalam equivocating on the word cause because it conflates a natural cause with a supernatural cause in the conclusion? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I'd have to listen to maybe, I don't think stated as such because. This, the argument in the syllogism that Craig uses, everything that begins exists has a cause, the, un the universe began to exist, the universe has a cause. It's just using the word cause as some kind of sufficient condition. Uh, the nature of that sufficient condition is the very thing, well, there are two things in dispute. 
whether there is that sufficient condition, whether it is and there is that sufficient condition. And then what is that sufficient condition like? All right. So with the former, whether there is the, the formality of the argument is just a, it's just it's just formal. If, if something begins to exist and the universe began to exist, if something that begins needs a cause and the universe began, then it needs a cause. The form of it has, as long as the word doesn't obviously have an equivocation in meaning, then, then there's fine. If the accusation is, yeah, but the, the conclusion that he draws gives a certain nature to that cause that wasn't in the premises, uh, I don't see that ever happens. What I see happens in the actual debate is that once the person says, granted, if something began, then it needs a cause, let's say they grant it, and granted, the universe began, so granted, the universe needs a cause, then where the argument goes is, but who's to say that that cause is God? Now, that's, that's a separate argument, whether the cause is itself some kind of quantum state, you know, as, as, uh, as um, Lawrence Krauss tries to argue, or whether they're swirling mathematical points, as Peter Atkins tried to argue uh, in his debate with Greg, whether it's that or not, it's just trying to give more, fill out the content of the word cause. That's, that's all it's doing. I don't, I don't see a problem with it. Uh, by, and I don't see any kind of equivocation thing going on, unless I'm missing something. All right. Thanks, Richard. Um, if the existence of God is a philosophical question, how can we avoid making personal or subjective philosophical statements about God? Are the atheists arguing that we can't find objective truth with philosophy? So uh, if I'm following the question, this touches on another very important dimension of this whole conversation. <clears throat> and that is the, what we can and ought to say about the issue before us, in this case, the existence and nature of God, what we can and ought to say about it with respect to just the, the, uh, the speculative uh, intellectual assessment of the terms and what they mean and the logic and whether it's valid and all that. That's one thing. The, the other is a moral aspect of how people respond uh, to the subject matter. When it comes to arguing whether, uh, you know, Pluto ought to be a planet or not, you're not going to gin up a lot of emotion or, or deep moral sentiment, I suspect, over that. But whether we talk about God, what makes it difficult as an actual human conversation? And I, and I think, and I think this is the Christian angle on this is that it's very hard for human beings to have a dispassionate discussion because as R.C. Sproul would argue, generally speaking, the indictment on the human race is that humans, because of our fallenness, have a vested interest in their not being a God. And so that actually does or can it, it, um, have a deleterious effect on our ability to be dispassionate and philosophically neutral and stuff. So uh, I, I take it there's a difference between common ground and neutral ground. Well, there really isn't neutral ground, strictly speaking, because people that are lost are in rebellion against God. But I mean, but I can't address that anyway. That's not an apologetics issue. That's a that's a moral issue between them and God, if there's a God. Right. And the Christians say that has to do with the Holy Spirit working in their heart, drawing them to Jesus. That's not something the apologist is equipped for that matter, even the evangelist is equipped to do anything about. What, what does the evangelist do? He gives the message of the gospel. What does the apologist do? He tries to defend it rationally, and that's it. What people do with that is, is we try to minimize as much as possible. And I know atheists that as far as they can, they're trying their best to be honest about these things. So here, here I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, not only are we, could we argue the existence of God and the truth of Christianity versus uh, uh, opposing points of view, but I think one thing that ought, one ought to consider when looking at these different systems, worldviews, as some people might call them, here's another thing to look at, is not only, well, how well does your worldview explain uh, all of these facts versus the other worldview? That's one thing, and that's what most of us are doing. But the other thing, that, there's a fact that rarely gets introduced into the conversation, in my experience, and that is, how well does your worldview explain why people don't accept your worldview? Does your worldview, does theism have a better explanation of why there are atheists than atheism has as to why there are theists? 
I submit to you, you don't find a, a, a fairly uniform model within atheism as to why people are theists. You find a battery. Freud thought it was a neurosis. Jung thought it was a, a, a something to do with the collective unconscious. Feuerbach thought it was an externalization of the perfect human being. Uh, other people may say it's just a scam that the power uh, in the society have, are trying to foster on the, on the weak and threaten them with hell. And you got to pay your money to the church or are you not? Are you going to languish in purgatory or something like that? They have explanations, but none of those explanations really arise out of atheism as atheism, Freudianism, Jungianism, Feuerbachianism, or whatever. But Christian theism, it's part of the Christian model that there would be atheists. That's it predicts that if you want to use scientific lingo, Christianity predicts there would be atheists. Now they might say, "Oh, well, that's a convenient answer." Okay, so in other words, if I've got an answer, that's supposed to be a weakness in my system. But if I didn't have an answer, you'd be that would be the weakness in my system. So when you try to give an answer, oh, well, that's convenient. Yeah, it is convenient because it's the answer. At least I think it's the answer. So it's not a liability because it answers the question you're asking. You know, I hear those responses sometimes. Oh, yeah, well, of course, Christians going to have to explain it. Well, isn't that better than not explaining it? If you think it's ad hoc or whatever, that's fine. We can have that conversation, but I, I submit to you, it's not ad hoc. It's not just something picked out of the blue and stuck on the Christian worldview to, to somehow, we got to figure out how to explain why there are people that don't like God. Well, you realize that's a central tenet of the Christian message. So I think Christianity has a better explanation of why they're atheists than atheists have a be- as an explanation of why they're Christian, personally. Cool. Thank you, Richard. That's, um, that's actually a, a good insight. Um, well, all right, we have, we're I'll gonna have to do, foot um, myself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to we're going to do. By the way, can I interrupt you? Uh, some sure. of that thinking comes from R.C. Sproul in his book. Okay. Uh, if there is a God, why are there atheists? So I have to I have to credit him in all, in all honesty. Yes, some of it, yes. at least. Cool. Um, two, there's two more questions, Richard. All right. Uh, so the first one is, don't atheists also sit with the potential problem of an infinite regress? Uh, it would seem so. Um, in fact, it's only been fairly recent in Western thought that the universe wasn't infinite in the past. That's the idea that it began a finite time ago is fairly recent and confirmed more by background echo, Big Bang Theory kind of stuff or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of literature on infinite regress arguments. In fact, I deal with some of those in my bibliography you can get off the website on theism and atheism if you're curious about but when i did my master's thesis at university of mississippi affectionately known as old miss o-l-e old miss and i thought craig's argument i laughed out loud it was so good and when i read the Kalam his book it had been out a while but i stumbled on it in the in the mid 80s and uh and so what i started doing is giving the argument in philosophy meetings and and such and then keeping up with additional objections that were being launched are things I found in the academic literature after Craig wrote his book. So he couldn't possibly anticipate every possible objection. Uh, things like, well, the, the, even if the Kalam proves that the universe had a cause, and even if you, well, and whatever you go on to say about the cause, how do you know the cause still exists? Builder of my house may die, but I still the house. So maybe the builder of the universe died and we still have the universe. How do you know? How do you know that that causes good as opposed to evil? Uh, how do you know there's not more than one? These are human. Hume brings these up in his dialogues. I mean, after all, you build a ship. It takes a whole bevy of humans to build a ship. Well, you would think it'd take a whole bunch of gods to build something like the universe. So how do you know there's only one? And so I think that those are fair. Uh, they're not really objections or as much as they're challenges to the Kalam in its bare syllogism. And so when you listen to people like a Bill Craig, they go on to give additional arguments. Here's, here's why we think he still exists or why we think he's good or why we think there's only one. And so he has those, but those are, I argue, additional to the original argument. And that's the kind of stuff I tried to do with in my, in my thesis. So I was convinced of the infinite regress, impossibility of the infinite regress. Um, the Tristram Shandy example, I think, shows a, a flagrant contradiction. If, if any of you are feel, familiar with the example uh, in Lawrence Stern's um, uh, The Life and Times of Tristram Jan- Sandy Gentleman. There's a story he gives where Tristram Shandy's writing his autobiography. And 
the problem is it takes him an entire year to write one day's events. So his first year of life, he writes about the first day of his life. Second year of life, he writes about the second day of the first year. Third year of life, he writes about the third day of the first year. So the question is, could Tristram Shandy ever finish his autobiography? Mathematicians picked up on that as a thought experiment and started talking about, and Bertrand, Bertrand Russell has discussions about this. Pamela Hubie has, a, has a discussions about this. Others, uh, well, then once the Kalam sort of got on people's radar screen, then they started going, well, what if Tristram Sandy had been writing his autobiography from eternity past? And there, what I think you can show are just flat out contradictions that would follow. So if you got, a, uh, if you got an argument that leads to a contradiction as a conclusion, then at least one of your premises has to be false. And so the argument that's false is that the universe, uh, the past could be infinite. That's what I, I, that's some of the stuff I argued in my, in my thesis. So there's a lot of great literature out there. You can get the bibliography. I think it's on my website. Otherwise I'll, I'll put it there and you can keep in touch with the leaders here in, in Rasha Christie and say, is how ever put that thing on his website and I'll let them know. And they'll keep reminding me, did you ever get that and go, no, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last wow, that was a that's a, an echo or something that I'm hearing. Okay, um, how does one deal with the popular atheist objection that the existence of a good God is incompatible with the existence of evil? So the short answer there is um, to challenge them to show what the inconsistency, where it resides, basically. <clears throat> And I think the consensus that I'm familiar with in, in all camps, atheists and theists in academic, <clears throat> is that it's not a logical problem. Okay, well, that, you know, there's not a logical problem that Frodo took the ring to Mordor either. There's no logical, he doesn't violate a law of logic, it just but it still happens to not be true. But it is, a no, it is something to say that there's not a logical problem. That kind of got a lot of stuff off people off the hook. But is it a, is it a philosophical, moral problem? And let, let me just bring something up that raises more questions than you can possibly answer. It's a whole nother presentation. In my humble opinion, part of the problem, a large, <clears throat> in fact, almost all of the problem is predicated on a faulty view about what good and evil even are in the first place. So as a classical theist and as a Thomist, this, in this Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, what good and evil mean is, or let me come from the other direction, <clears throat> moral good and evil is a subset of good and evil. Good and evil are categories of which moral good and evil is just a certain subset, whatever I mean by all of that. I think the problem is that the, the contemporary discussion fails to adequately deal with the question of what good and evil are to begin with, metaphysically speaking. And that has immense implications for how one will go on to try to answer, supposedly, uh, try to answer the, the, the so-called problem of evil. Uh, and I'm sorry, I can't say much more about that without just bringing up more and more categories that themselves are going to just say, well, that, they all sort of, there's an anterior issues I'd have to sort of unpack and define and everybody'd be sound asleep. <laughs> well, know, and, uh, I know what we can do. Yeah. We can just uh, get you back for another event on the problem of evil. Oh, man. Uh, I'd love that. I, I, I'm always uh, uh, fishing for that. So maybe that's what I, my ulterior motive was. I guess you'll have to have me back. You know, because <laughs> uh, I love, I love, I've loved it. We could talk about those kind of things. And, and in the meantime, if a person is, um, curious about what my thoughts might be. If you go to the website, richardghow.com, click on resources, click on PDF decks, and then scroll down and find the presentation I did on the problem of evil. I'll give you this one warning though. If you do get some of these PDF slide decks, it's very possible that in any given slide deck, there's gonna be a slide in there that it isn't obvious what it means because you don't hear the accompanied talk necessarily, which I always tell audiences, it's tempted me to just stick a picture that's completely irrelevant, right in the middle of a, a de of a presentation to see if anybody would call and go. So I was looking at your thing on the existence of God. It, exactly what is that kumquat argument for God? You know, we like kumquats here or 
you know, you pick your favorite vegetable or watermelon or oranges, you know, what is that apple argument you I just stuck that in there. You know, it has nothing to do with it. Yeah, I want to see, put an elephant in it. What's, your, what's that elephant argument for God's existence? Oh, that's a great one. But anyway, so, but they can, get a, they can get a pretty good idea of my thinking in terms of this Augustinian uh, slash Aristotelian notion, or I should put them in more historical order, of, of good and evil in, a, in Thomistic. Uh, and then the implications they have for the problem of evil. You look for two slide decks, one the problem of evil and the other natural law theory. We deal, we deal with those in there. All right. Well, Richard, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time. And please um, say hello to Rebecca. Absolutely. And, uh, yes, we hope that uh, when all this COVID-19 stuff clears mm -hmm. up, we can we can have you back here in South uh, Africa. I hope so, man. Day and I'm having withdrawals. Uh, I, I, it's been too long since I've been to the country. And, and I've been there six times, and I'm getting addicted. Uh, to the country, the landscaping, the animals, and mostly the people. And I brag on you guys so much. Everywhere I go, I tell, tell my fellow American Christians uh, how much God's doing with the, you guys fighting the good fight down there. I mean, and, and some of them kind of want to get in on it. Uh, I, I'm, I sort of dread the day when you think, you know what, we got enough apologists. You guys need to stay home. <laughs> but I'm thinking, maybe not. Maybe we could still find something to get in on down in South Africa because they're, they're on fire. It's what I tell my friends. So God is glorified by, by what's happening there. All right. No, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we we thank appreciate you. you and Rebecca. Absolutely. And um, all right. Uh, thank you for listening this evening to um, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back again next Thursday, Thursday evening with another online event. So please join us again. Um, and that's all for this week. I can just remind you to go and visit our website. And um, also, you'll find, I didn't mention this, there is a link to uh, Richard Richard's website in the description of this video as well. You can also <clears throat> just um, find it there. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a blessed evening further.